Hey, um, so I, uh, this talk I think uh, is going to be uh, on a private cloud, uh, our journey to private cloud, which covers all our decisions, the goals that we need for private cloud and uh, so it's, it's mostly going to be a philosophy behind it, why did we decide we need to have a private cloud and uh, what are the technical challenges behind it and how did we go about them and how did we achieve and where are we so far in the journey. Uh, so about myself, I work as lead DevOps engineer at Media.net. Uh, Media.net is an ad tech company. Uh, we operate from Mumbai and Bangalore. So how many of you here operate from a bare metal data center? So probably most of this talk is going to cover things uh, on a bare metal data center. But yeah, we also have philosophies that is needed in a public cloud. Uh, so other than that, there are few takeaway points you could take here and there. Uh, what what could be a philosophy that you could uh, deploy in the public cloud as well. Uh, there are certain points where you could probably think these are all the things that you take from a public cloud cloud for granted, and you could you know you could actually uh, give a thought about the high availability environment the public cloud is offering to people just out of box. So as a company. Uh, we started sometime uh, between 2008-2009 and our product started coming out around 2010. So initially it's all like uh, uh, we operated from a single bare metal DC and then we scaled out to multi DC. So on a single bare metal DC when we started operating most of the hardwares that we got are kind of like a pretty uniform hardware like 32 cores, uh, 32 GB RAM, 64 cores, 32 GB RAM. You just get them put the monolithic code on over it so the whole uh, dynamic application serving is a single monolithic uh, PHP code which goes to all your doc roots, all the directories and you have 32 of search web servers and uh, sometimes the 32 code box might not be used up with uh, just the dynamic serving app so people try to decouple, people try to put unrelated things together so if there will be multiple monolithic things running from a single server uh, or a bunch of servers. They, this is how it started working and uh, when the company, uh, so this is how when the company was around like 100 people, things are all fine. Uh, there was, uh, just deploy your monolith, scale it up, buy new hardware whenever you want and things started working fine. And then in 2012, uh, the DevOps team first started, uh, we saw Linux containers coming in. And with the next containers, we decided uh, because earlier there was infrastructure we are sharing for the DevOps stuff with the production infrastructure team. Then we started, we got our own boxes to run uh, config management like Puppet, Puppet DB, Nagios, and everything separate from the production infra. And we also uh, wanted to have separate environments for each of these uh, applications, uh, like uh, upgrading Ruby in one of the. Uh, so one of the things like Puppet should not affect the other part, other application. So we decided to go with Linux containers where you actually have multiple environments for each of the DevOps stuff. So this is what the DevOps team started moving to containers, all the apps started running as independent apps. Though it's on a single bare metal, there are isolated environments they started having. Then as the scaling demand increased, though uh, the bare metal data center scaling is always difficult, like it involves uh, it's not a single day transition that you can do. So when the company uh, uh, ex exponentially progressed and you are supposed to do the elasticity, you are supposed to have the elasticity in the company. So we decided to go to adapt to a public cloud trans uh, public cloud as well. So we just operated, we are still operating in a hybrid environment. We operate from a bunch of our data centers managed by us, uh, co-located data centers and, uh, and AWS at multiple regions. So once we started operating from cloud, so the migration to cloud, usually I think how many of you in cloud uh, is spawning boxes exactly to the uh, requirement of your app. Say you have one app um, which needs four cores or eight cores, some C4 or 2x large or C4.x large instance. How many of you just spawn exactly to that need? Like you guys figure out and do it. So it involves some time actually for you guys to come up with that number that this requirement uh, or this instance type will fit for me. So uh, since we were already, always operating from monolithic code, we decided 
This third core instance is working fine for us. So we will spawn a closely matching similar instance in AWS and just move our monoliths there as well. As long as you make sure your uh, calls to DBs and stuff, everything, all transactions are all properly saved by putting a lot of processes in the DB part. We just didn't change the application architecture itself. We moved it. Things started working fine. We uh, there was no downtime. We are scaling. We go with the elasticity as such. But you understand, right? There is a you, know, you have actually thrown in um, money to solve the problem. You haven't solved it efficiently, and this is something that was bothering the DevOps team continuously. Then the DevOps team actually uh, so it's usually the problem comes up because there are legacy thing that is left in the team and. Uh, uh, the most of the startups don't have the legacy burden that they have to carry up. Here we have certain legacy stuff that's already written. So in any company which is like, which has a legacy burden, there are also newer teams that come in which adds more intelligence to the system, which adds more um, features to the system. So all those new teams uh, started going to the microservice infrastructure. So we, the first point we made is all the newer projects that's coming up, which is finding a spam in um, clicks or something of that sort, whatever a new project or new feature that comes up, that would that would automatically use a micro will embrace a microservice um, infrastructure. So there we started microservice infrastructure. So I'm not going to say microservice is a solution to all. Uh, there are certain apps which does not fit to microservices and things which we will see the philosophy as we go further. Now the bare metal data center. So this. Microservice data, uh, micro, microservices structure we started in both public cloud as well as in the private cloud. So still the legacy infrastructure says as it is, it still runs monolithic. So we started building up our own private cloud infra. First we started at one of our bare metal DC, where we are going to, we have a plan to slowly move all these monolithic things, whichever can be moved to microservices. So this is, this is the path so far we are taking and I'll uh, try to cover why all these design philosophies are uh, decisions are being taken. So, why private cloud actually? Because it's not going to be why public cloud because everybody knows why public cloud is. So, why private cloud? So, the first thing I, I said, like if people have a monolithic infrastructure uh, and they have a 32 core uh, and 64 GB RAM, and if that monolithic code is not going to run in a 30 core, 32 cores, for, for example, even at its 99 percentile is still just operating out of 18 cores, uh, people uh, might think we could also, so and uh, in a typical bare metal data center, it's sometimes only during after CapEx planning, the orders for the servers will be placed and still Dell takes at least a month time to uh, bring all those servers to your DCs and then there is a time involved in racking and stuff. Uh, which for people in public cloud apparently has not facing these days. So in those cases, the apps which have to be quickly deployed, they figure out which are our boxes which are underutilized and they put that service on it. For example, the static and dynamic content serving happens from a single box, uh, like a, a bunch of single boxes, a bunch of boxes. They are completely decoupled things. So what is the problem in having a two decoupled services running from same box? The problem that you have is, A, uh, you have no point of ownership, so if you go to migrate or if you go to upgrade your infrastructure, you need to talk to a bunch of devs, it's not going to be a single point of contact that you have because there are multiple services running on your uh, thing and uh, upgrading a single package in your system, a config management can go and upgrade but it can still go and break some other team because there's no transparency in which team depends on which services instead of you could make a tailor-made service and give them that infrastructure that completely isolates them from other applications. So that is one of the advantage you get when you go to a cloud or a microservice. Uh, efficient utilization of resources. So it's again a causal effect of this. If you want to keep decoupled on a bare metal DC with bare metal systems without using any of these virtualization stuff, then yeah, your resources are going to be underutilized. Uh, there is no way you could make sure that this is 100% utilized and the other one is quicker provisioning. So why, what do I mean by quicker provisioning is like the uh, delay that comes in racking and procurement and racking of servers. 
cloud does not give you elasticity as such uh, in a private sense. A public cloud gives you elasticity because there are boxes lying around already which are purchased and uh, they run it as spot, whichever is lying idle and then they move it to on demand and stuff. In a private cloud, still your capex has to be done because there is uh, magically a box won't appear and again um, in a private cloud, uh, the only advantage you could have is on a single click your, contain your containers or VMs just come up but still your capex has to be done because the, uh, buying, a, uh, buying a bunch of servers and keeping them idle and then powering on only when needed doesn't make sense economically. So uh, the more the green are bad we are right now and uh, the more the white shades we are still to cover them up. So right now a few uh, a percent of a DC still operates from uh, bare metal servers without any virtualization and like it has multiple unrelated monolithic code running on them. We migrated to, we started with our private cloud so which, which from next slide onwards I am going to cover. So that helped us in having a decoupled monolithic services but still they are running out of KVM as decoupled services and this microservices which the other team is taking care of, which the newer team started moving to microservices infrastructure is using microservices. Uh, so to make it completely microservices we need to build a lot of support infra around the uh, around our infrastructure like collecting logs and uh, so in, you have a public on a public cloud you could put it as three or something of that sort. Here we are building our own object storage. Uh, and so that's one of the challenges. Microservices need a bunch of supporting infra. So we are building all the supporting infra which a microservice would need. And so the newer teams are microservices and legacy teams are pretty much mostly on uh, decoupled microservices and when the support infra is in place. And when these teams uh, who has a business sense to invest and refactor the code and then go on to microservices will jump on to microservices and a bunch of event based systems which gets triggered like a mail system which gets triggered on an event or an SMS system which gets triggered on an event. So those things instead of getting uh, we, we are thinking of putting a pool of boxes and then uh, use a function as a service like lambda. So that is something still in a POC stage. Uh, we are evaluating a bunch of ways to call a function as a service and uh, so in a public cloud we will continue to use lambda on a private cloud we will have a um, function handler uh, to handle events. So the stack selection, um, so we evaluated OpenStack and CloudStack for our private cloud. So it's a very preliminary parameter I'm saying. So OpenStack as such is a medium to difficult setup uh, in uh, software. It has a very good community support and a very good modular code base. CloudStack is since it's a single uh, piece of software which comes up on its own and uh, which is easier to set up and get your first VM on the cloud very fast. It is it's single, it's slightly monolithic, so you don't have much flexibility or a modular support like OpenStack is, and um, the community support is moderate. It's it is still buggy and stuff. So initially, the uh, team started out with CloudStack in our case, and um, we started working with CloudStack itself because it's going to be a transient infra if you see on the pipeline like very few of the services will uh, reside here and more, most of them will go to Mesos or Kubernetes. So we went with CloudStack. Uh, so there are certain challenges which we had to come up with workarounds since there is no modular support available as such. We would have worked with OpenStack out of box. I will just uh, take you guys through that as well now. So this is what a goal, uh, this is a pretty much a simpler goal anybody would see here. You have VMs to take care of a dynamic content. The CDNs will call your static contents with a varnish or something which will take care of it. So static content doesn't have to be in anywhere in storage. They could be somewhere in object store and you could just fetch and give them to the CDNs. The dynamic contents will be taken up. Uh, so this storage has to be decoupled. Your root file system, everything will be decoupled. Which So all this is in Amazon already. This is your uh, EBS, this is your S3, uh, that is your EC2. And you need to have a tagging system so that uh, uh, inventory system where you could just figure out how much of cost this team is using, how much of instances this team is running and stuff. Okay, so uh, three key components we are trying to bring into a private cloud are high available block storage and object storage and uh, a proper inventory system. 
So still object storage is in our pipeline, we haven't successfully done it. Uh, we have come up with a block storage. So why, uh, why elastic block storage is more important in a cloud environment? So think of this when uh, you guys all know that there is an AWS uh, instance store, right? Where you just, uh, when your instance goes down, your storage also goes down. Like the, it's, it's, it's completely like a run. So uh, HA storage, which is decoupled from your compute, actually gives you a, gives you a flexibility. Uh, like you can migrate instance from, uh, migrate your VM from one host to the other host. And it happens immediately because your storage is over network and your storage is not locally on a box. So you don't have to copy uh, contents from the local disk of this box to the other box. So migrations are easy, it's flexible, but it has its own impact. So if your network to the high, uh, to the storage goes down, your whole DC is down. It's equivalent to your whole DC catching fire or whole DC is under flood or whole DC has no internet access. So a storage is a single point of failure if you don't make it properly. So there's a lot of design considerations we took on it. So I'll just go through them fast because I'm um, out of time. So the, the options that we had for block storage are a bunch of these. I'm going through each of them. So a network file system, a network file system is where uh, you have a big disk lying on some box and you expose it as NFS and all your VM volume or to all your hosts where your VMs are going to run and all your VM volumes are just a QCurve file and the, it works on its own. The, unless you use a proprietary infrastructure like uh, NetApp or something, this NFS has its own issues like what if the NFS box goes down, you will have so your idea is you will have another NFS box, then you have to have a DRBD or something which replicates from this NFS box all the contents of the other NFS box. Even then, uh, the IP of the NFS has to float from this box <laughs> to the other box when a failure happens. So the floating IP takes time, you have a gratitude SR, there is a time. So if you have a small delay in reaching a disk, the kernel panics can start happening even though if it is few seconds. A shared mount point is again something similar, instead of NFS, you run a GFS or something, you have a disk exposed via iSCSI on all boxes and they have a clustered file system running over there. So all the problems that are listed in NFS stays here as well. Plus it has uh, the locks in GFS are kind of, I find them personally is more difficult to debug, but uh, it, it again is an opinionated decision from myself. So this is one of the software, Ceph, which we are completely happy with. Uh, but we <coughs> ran into some issues, uh, but still we are investing our time on it. I think this would definitely uh, be a good open source replacement for a distributed block storage. So Ceph is actually an object store, uh, like S3, but they have a libredos kernel module which helps you to make it work as a block store as well. So it, ha it, it works from multiple boxes. It has a monitor and um, which monitors them for the health checks and based on that it updates a map. So each file is distributed to multiple chunks and each chunk is part of some placement groups. And the placement groups are distributed redundantly across multiple OSD. So if one OSD goes down, the other OSD can respond to your placement group. So this is actually a better high available uh, block storage that you can think of and it also works from normal boxes, you, uh, you could put your JBOTs and make this up and running. So we see a degradation in performance whenever there is a failover and the placement groups are shuffled which is which is common which happens even when you rebalance your Hadoop cluster which happens when you rebalance any of this. But the, during this time we see some kernel panics happening on the VM so we haven't gone production with this but this is something which we are still uh, putting time to uh, invest on. We went to with HP 3 part. So that's a very poop PJ, so don't see the image of it, it's a poor joke, so leave that. So going back to uh, what HP 3 par is, I'm not, I'm not uh, endorsing HP 3 par as a product. HP 3 par is one of those so, so hardware proprietary system like NetApp is. Uh, we got it because we acquired one of the companies and they have a HP 3 par with them and we moved it to our uh, data center while we were testing all these stuff. So what a HP 3 par does is it exposes you iSCSI uh, volumes as iSCSI endpoints. And I can actually give it to, uh, I can carve LVMs to people and give LVMs to each VM. And so we, what we did is we exposed a 48 TB 
initially to start with we started with 48 dB 48 dB bigger volume from HP3 bar we exposed it to all our uh, host machines and the host machines run a cluster LVM thing which creates LVM for these boxes and then they whenever a VM asks for this it creates an LVM and then gives it to the VM so there are a bunch of things the switch via which the host contacts HP3 bar is made HA with Cisco Nexus technology so that you know you, even if one switch goes down there is always another path with which you can reach and each host connects to HP3 bar via multiple network paths we have 8 network paths so that if even uh, so usually it's round robin but if one network path goes down they will try they will use the other network paths so you have a highly available storage system so I try to mean that with that uh, both. So CLVM is a Red Hat tool which supports um, lock, uh, which supports carving LVM because while you carve LVM from multiple boxes, you have to actually make sure the metadata is not corrupt. If the metadata is corrupt, the whole LVM is corrupt. If the whole LVM is corrupt, you just lose out everything. So we started with CLVM. CLVM uses CoroSync and DLM, but more DLM is distributed lock manager. So this has an unsteady lock state. Like you, it's very difficult for us to figure out which box actually took the lock. Uh, whenever the fail, whenever it, uh, uh, a cluster completely becomes not possible to create new disks because there is a split brain. And uh, since most of the locks are kernel level, you have to do a reboot thing. And even after reboot, there is no guarantee that the cluster comes back on the same state. So the reboot chaos and thing, the it, it, it became a little bit chaotic in the infrastructure. Once you put a cloud, you ask people to move and then after some time the LVM infra is not stable. The VMs are still, still be running because your disks are already created but you can't create new VMs. So you say we are on maintenance, we are fixing things, we will get back to you. So if, if the maintenance mail comes every day then people will just lose the infra. So it made us to think some way to fix this issue. So we started writing our own LVM lock tool um, over the um, CLVM thing because CLVM uses the mesh topology where a single instance usually uh, you know uh, all the instances before getting locked talks to all other instances and then they get the lock. Instead we created a kind of like three persons who are who are supposed to issue tokens uh, to your uh, to the machine and whichever to machine which got the token successfully will write LVM and other machines will supposed to wait. So this latency is only when the instance is spawned. After that, there is nothing, no latency you guys will see on it. So what we did here is we have a Redis endpoint. The L, whenever LV create call has happened uh, or LV remove anything of those uh, metadata calls have happened, the host machines where it is going to run will try to write in a simple channel, let's assume three Redis instances. It tries to get the lock from all the three Redis instances, which is basically writing to a key successfully. Uh, with their PID and the box name. So if they write successfully, cool, they get the lock. If they don't write successfully, that means somebody has already got the lock. So if they get more than 50% of the lock, then there is no other person who effectively has the right to write to the LVM. Only this host machine is affected right to the LVM. So they start writing to the LVM and once they are done, they will delete all these locks. So the only thing is we make sure there is no concurrent access due to split brain or something of that sort because it's stress tested and we gave more preference to remain in a deadlock state than corrupting the metadata because at any chance we can't have a corrupted metadata. So in a deadlock right now it's not automated healing we are doing we are just checking if any instance has crashed after uh, taking a lock then we, we give up the lock ourselves after we think, think it's safe to delete the lock. Or else if some of those commands went into an uninterruptible sleep state, like D state, then we could we can't do much. We have to reboot the box like the same CLVM thing. But it's better to manage than a kernel level lock where we have very less control on and a mesh topology which uh, tries to work on its own. So yeah, last few slides, I will just uh, wrap them fast. So networking. So networking is... Uh, Storage is over network, we know it. The VM should have their own data network as well. So, uh, we are on a multi tenant infra, so we don't want to have uh, a, a GRE or between your GRE tunnels between uh, VM to VM communications. We are just ourselves with RDC. So, we have a single L2 bridge 
which connects the actual uh, interface to that bridge and whichever VMs comes they will also connect to the same bridge and they just make a DHCP call um, and they get a IP from the VLAN of the EGO. Our DHCP runs on the same VLAN where EGO runs. So that's it. We have a separate disk, uh, separate network uh, interface, separate VLAN and uh, for the storage and a separate network uh, infrastructure and a separate VLANs for the actual data network. Now this applies to both the public and the private cloud. We follow the same auditing and accounting policy where uh, you every team has to tag an instance and they spawn it with which team it belongs to, who is the owner, which product and a bunch of other tags. Based on that we actually figure out um, how much cost the team is incurring and we, if, if it is within the permissible limit, each team has their own budget if it is within the permissible limit. If a team is not tagging properly because which happens if it's a uh, if it's spawned by APIs, it's usually, machines do work usually better, they spawn it with all necessary tags. But if it is by a human, human do miss tags. So what we have is we have this, now we have this dragging system which people in our company dread, are usually dreaded, we just send out mail till they fill tags, we keep on sending mails till they fill tag. So at one point, they actually, so it's a Google form, they just fill those tags. Then uh, if it's a public cloud, we have public cloud, AWS APIs, we push it, those tags. And if it's a private cloud, even all these clouds that can open stack as their APIs, we push it, all the instances get tagged, they, all the volume stores get tagged, and then we could do a cost analysis and we can audit. So yeah, I'm done. Uh, so acknowledgements to the whole team, uh, which was peaceful with us all through the migration. We had ups and downs and who have worked specifically for the private cloud as well as the container infrastructure. The system operations teams take care of the procurement of hardware, racking of them and everything uh, and the network operations team for taking care of all the network related infrastructure and multipath and switches and everything. And yeah, I stole all the images from this side. Thank you. Somebody have any questions? Questions or anything you want? Please don't ask the speaker to speak. Sure, this is on. Okay. So uh, I was just trying to understand the rationale behind the uh, the CLBM and the SIF deployments and so on. So let's say your VMs are inherently uh, expendable. Then why have storage HA at all? We are saying a stateless VMs probably. Uh, okay. So yeah, so the, once people move to container infra, which I said, people are also doing stateless thing. So people are experimenting spot in AWS where the storage goes, everything goes, but they are okay with it because the app is just a jit put and do it. But yeah. monolithic apps are actually heavy. They have even their images and stuff in it. Like we don't have still the object storage part coming in. So syncing uh, 2 GB is easier than syncing 200 GB. Sometimes yeah, whole, the jar that people deploy is huge because there are static contents on it. So that's why having a HA helps migration right now. But when we reach the point where uh, the whole inf most of the infra is in uh, container stateless point, that's something which we are looking at. When we move completely to container infrastructure, we will go stateless. All the newer teams are stateless and they use object store for uh, heavy contents. So when we also, when all the legacy teams also started moving to it, we, we, this won't be a bigger requirement for us. That time, uh, we can just operate from our uh, local files. Use the percentage of HAVR. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? The question is right. Uh, so, um, so, public cloud is already there, right? So, is there a specific requirement for private? match to their, uh, uh, so is there a specific requirement need where you can look at a private cloud? So at a certain point, um, A, uh, when, uh, so we are looking at, so I don't have a real cost analysis of public and private cloud, but at certain point I think when we have, uh, we, when we are checking at, 
uh, when we are beyond a certain scale, I think a private cloud which can come out cheaper to you than a public cloud. So this is something which, and we, we anyway have invested heavily on a private, uh, we anyway, on our co-located data centers, we have uh, all the bare metals lying around. So once we have a apple to apple ready, probably during next con, I can give you exact uh, update whether we actually reduce the price because right now we are aggressively looking on the cost comparison between both the clouds, but still apps are not taking the private cloud completely. Once the apps are completely moved to private cloud, I can give a call. But our assumption is we can uh, we can get a better deal if we just uh, if we go with the private cloud and you have the scale to manage it. So it, it's like you should have enough number of site level engineers and DevOps to throw at it. If you don't have enough number of site level engineers and DevOps team to throw at it, then obviously it's a management overhead for the company as well. So we are uh, we have a 60 member site level engineer team and 20 members from the college joining up. So we have enough people to throw at this. So I think. Uh, so it depends on the, it's again depends on the scale that people work on, it depends on the employee cost that is thrown at it. But I can, I, I don't have an actual number because this has just, we, we have just gone live. So once we, once I have the exact number, probably after 3-4 months, I could comment, did we actually make savings? If we don't actually make savings, then obviously we will stick to a public cloud. Uh, if we make savings, then uh, we need to take a call and face on that. This is the DevOps team size, right? And what would be what is the volume of uh, people you serve or the employees or the customers? So employees, I mean this the, is basically for internal employee consumption or for customer consumption. This is the, everything. The production app goes here, or the whole product runs will run from here. Yeah. So we so we make a billion of ad impressions uh, every day. So all these ad impressions will go from here. What is your primary motive behind uh, trying out this private cloud? So yeah, the primary motive is efficient utilization of resources. The resources and uh, ease flexibility in during migrations. Right now we just took the migration from, uh, from CentOS to Debian. Uh, uh, there are other migrations that if you do, you do certain migrations. It becomes really difficult if decoupled systems run together. You have to go to each people, talk to them like, this is what happening. This is what happening. It's when when everything is virtualized and uh, having container on top of it, you could the updating the host version. You need nobody's permission. You can just send out mail like AWS. Hey, this infra is going down. Reboot your instance. Uh, people could reboot the instance. It gets scheduled at some other place, and your infrastructure is updated. So that's one thing. The other thing is utilization of resources. Like I said, there are boxes which are over which uh, which have the little course thinking it might need it, but it is not actually used at all. Uh, and in a bad middle, you bought a box, the box lies there with the two cores. Instead, uh, if you can somehow create environments for multiple teams to share that resource, and later on, if they actually need the two cores, can, uh, there should be a way to migrate other people who we provision there. So, that is the whole point why we actually went to the private cloud.